This week, we are in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to begin looking at this paragraph from verses 6 through 10, the title of our sermon, From Riches to Rags. You've heard that old saying, from rags to riches. We're going to walk through this paragraph in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, and we're going to reverse that. I'm going to show you how that's reversed. Paul brilliantly reverses that here. From riches to rags, and here's the text, beginning in verse 6. The Bible says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In our text today, it brings the bear, Paul brings this to bear to Timothy in this letter to the, the church at Ephesus, that one of the great truths of the Bible is that the truth of God is countercultural. The truth of God is against, runs counter to the hopes and dreams and reasonings and fabrications and imaginations of this world. It runs against the nature, if you will, of the natural man. These things are foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned and he cannot understand them. And in attempting to fulfill his own understanding, an attempt to chase off after his own lusts and after his desire, what does this foolish natural man do but invent his own religion? He wants worldly gain. Christ says to pursue godly gain, produce and pursue heavenly gain. And in the pursuit of his own lust, he just creates his own religion. He creates a religion that when he dies, he's promised 7,000 vestal virgins. That is, that is a wicked religion simply designed to satisfy a person's own lusts. We can see it in quote-unquote evangelicalism today when someone wanting to be rich, wanting to satisfy their own lusts, their own desires, quote-unquote invent a health, wealth, prosperity gospel, enabling them to justify the pursuit of their own lusts and do it under the canopy, so to speak, of what it means to be Christian. These are lies. These are false professing Christians simply justifying themselves in their sin. Now, from this text this morning, I want you to see three things. Beginning in verse 6, we're going to look at what it is to have heavenly riches. Next, we're going to look at worldly rags. Finally, a hellish result. So we'll look at heavenly riches first. True gain, true riches are found only in Christ. True gain is defined by God, defined in Scripture, and it's found only in godliness with contentment. Next, we'll look at worldly rags. Those desiring the riches of this world are dumpster diving. They're swimming around in a, in a sewer looking for fresh water to drink, looking for something that will satisfy, and they're just getting sewage. Worldly riches, in reality, are filthy rags when compared to true riches in Christ. And lastly, we'll look at the hellish result of pursuing worldly riches. There is an eternal poverty, an eternal impoverishment, an eternal penalty for turning your back on pursuing true riches in Christ Jesus. It is like the dog going back to eat its own vomit. It's like the pig going back to living in its own filth. This is the person that turns their back on heavenly riches to pursue worldly rags. And so let's take a look at verse 6 and look at heavenly riches in verse, verses 6 through 8. Paul explained that in verse 5, the false teachers in Ephesus supposed that godliness was a means of getting rich. So like a bunch of huckster, charlatan, snake oil salesmen, they desired to get rich by exploiting God's people. That's what they were doing. And in this now, you got to understand, they're acting like brute beasts. They're just bounding off after their own lusts, and they're using God's people to satisfy that, to attain their own desires. And Paul is warning us here in a, a beautiful and amazing economy of words, that listen, they have got it wrong. They've got it wrong. These swindlers are dead wrong about godliness. They are dead wrong about gain. 
They're dead wrong about true contentment. They're dead wrong about the gospel, dead wrong about Christ, dead wrong about church. They are dead wrong in their perspective on the Christian life. They are dead wrong. With true riches, true gain is only possible in Christ. And once again, by this point in the letter, Paul is seething. He begins the letter to Timothy raging against false teaching in Ephesus. It is wreaking havoc on the church and many are being led away shipwrecked to the faith. Here, Paul again is seething over these false teachers who are leading people away to their own damnation. People are actually listening to these frauds. And he's saying here, we, the church at Ephesus, down through the ages to you and I, we must have a right perspective on what it is to be gainful in Christ and a true right perspective on heavenly riches. So he begins in verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. The first perspective that we need here the first perspective needed is a spiritual perspective. Pursuing heavenly riches requires a spiritual perspective on riches. What does it mean to have great gain? And it begins with the word in verse 6, now. Now there is a contrast word. It is contrasting verse 6 with verse 5 that went above. They, those false teachers, those sharks in Ephesus, suppose that godliness, their own twisted perversion of it, was a means of lining their pockets, right? They had a worldly perspective. They looked at gain as no more than filling their wallet. They looked at godliness as nothing more than a means to get there. Godliness to them wasn't something that was produced internally by the Spirit of God in them. It was just the mask that they wore to the devil's ball. It was the candy sugary coating that covered or masked the taste of the poison they were dishing out. They disguised themselves as angels of light to simply fulfill their own lusts. Now, with the right spiritual perspective, you need to see these frauds for who they are, for what they are. Doesn't matter how nice they seem. It doesn't matter how well they seem to get along. Listen, they are wearing a mask. They are dishing out poison in a beautiful container. They're masquerading as angels of light. Don't be fooled. Swing the sword of the Spirit exercise your discernment and understand them for what they are. Paul says in verse 6 that godliness is great gain, but not in the way that these crooks thought. He's defining great gain from a spiritual perspective, and that's the perspective that we need to have. Now, he says here that great gain, he describes great gain. If you look at this phrase in verse 6 in the Greek, Great gain is pushed all the way forward into an emphatic position. He wants to emphasize. Literally, it says... Now, it is great gain that ends up with godliness and contentment, right? Great gain pushed all the, way, all the way forward for emphasis. And notice it's not just gain. This is great gain, astonishing gain, surprising gain, staggering gain, all right? He puts it forward for emphasis. He adds the adjective great. And you and I, if you're in Christ and you've studied your Bible, spent any time in the Word of God at all, you can't help but recognize this as a dramatic understatement. When the Lord says that we have great gain, listen, it is great. It is staggering. It is infinite, unimaginable gain that we have in Christ. He says in, in chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said that godliness is profitable. Now, it's profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness has a promise for this life, and it has great gain promises for the life that is to come. Now, Christian, I want you to think for a moment about your gain in Christ. Think uh, for a moment about this. This should comfort you and encourage you. If you have turned from your sin, left that life that you were living for yourself, and if you, you have put all of your hope, all of your trust, all your faith, all your reliance in Christ alone to save you, then listen, develop, cultivate a right spiritual perspective of your great riches in Him. You have received pardon for your sin. <laughs> You've been forgiven. You have a present and perfect forgiveness. It's awesome. Your guilt has been renewed, re removed. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You've been made a new creation in Christ. You have been given acceptance in the beloved. You who were once an enemy of God by your wicked works, now accepted in the beloved. You've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You've been baptized into Christ 
and are now delightful to God in Him. All your sin, you're delightful to God. Amazing thought. God accepts our worship. He hears our prayer. He entertains our praises of Him. He accepts our offerings. You've been made a son or a daughter in the kingdom. And if sons, then heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Heirs of the kingdom by adoption into the family of God. Remember the hymn that goes, Behold what wondrous grace the Father has bestowed on sinners of a mortal race to call them sons of God. You've been given of his spirit by which you call out to the Father, Abba, Father. You've been set free from the law of sin and death. Likewise, the spirit also helps in our weakness, making intercession for us according to the will of God. In all things, you are made more than conquerors through him who loved us. You have communion with God that in times of difficulty, in times of trouble, he gives us joy. In times of great trial, you can have calm and grace. You live in the persistent and consistent joy of the fellowship of his saints. Your life no longer consists in what you possess or in what you lack. You find in Christ a sufficiency for all things, a soul-satisfying sufficiency. You've been given wisdom and sanctification and redemption and peace. And above all, you have inherited Christ with eternal life, free from sin, to worship him, to praise him with all the saints in glory, and to enjoy him forever. And now in Christ, you can say with Paul in Philippians 3 that what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I count also all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may, purpose here, know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now Paul is describing here in Philippians 3, his conversion as an accounting transaction. Now remember from that passage, all the, the accounting terms, count all things, have counted laws for Christ, count them as rubbish. These are all accounting terms. Everything prior to that Damascus Road experience for Paul, everything that was once in the asset part of his ledger, everything that was in the profit side of his ledger has now been transferred in Christ to the liability side. Everything is now a loss to him. Everything is counted as rubbish. And if you looked at Paul's ledger now, there is one word on the prophet side. One word on the asset side. That is Christ. It's a glorious, glorious truth. Everything he thought was profit suddenly now became a loss. Paul enters now only one word on his asset list, and that's Christ. Can you see why Moses, in Hebrews chapter 11, chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt? And he did it. There's an answer there. He did it looking to the reward. What was on the prophet side of Moses' ledger? Christ. What was on the asset side of Moses' ledger that we really looked forward to? Christ. Glorious, unspeakable gain, unimaginable gain. This is great gain. And this is just scratching the surface. Just scratching the surface. How could anyone be led astray from this? But it was happening here in Ephesus at the end of these wicked shark snake oil salesmen who were corrupting the gospel. You, as a Christian, must be able to say with a hymn writer, should all the forms that men devise assault my faith with treacherous art, I'd call them all vanity and lies and bind the gospel to my heart. Just vanity, lies, treacherous lies. They are treacherous. you got to protect yourself from that and the power of the Spirit. 
I would not change my blessed estate for all the world calls good or great. Do you have a spiritual perspective on your heavenly riches in Christ? You need that. You need to cultivate that in your life. Christians can sometimes lose sight of their heavenly riches and end up living like beggars, right? You've got a Ferrari engine, Ferrari in the driveway that you never take out. If you ever take the the Ferrari out of the driveway, you never get above first gear. Listen, you have a Ferrari. (laughs) You have heavenly riches, great gain. Avail yourself of those riches. Faith in Christ, avail yourself of the means of grace. Live for him according to his promises and live victoriously in Christ. You've got to claim those promises. Next from verse 6, we also see here not just a spiritual perspective on what true riches are, what heavenly riches are, but we also see here a Godward perspective, a Godward perspective. Paul says godliness with contentment. True godliness and true contentment are a fruit of the Spirit of God, a fruit of being born again. They are a fruit of genuine saving faith. Godliness with contentment is what it looks like to become a, a, be a citizen of the kingdom, right? You have godliness, which is Godward living. We're talking about a Godward perspective. Godliness is Godward living, a fear of God, right? Motivated by his word. Contentment is a Godward sufficiency. It's not a self-sufficiency. It's a Christ sufficiency, a Godward sufficiency. One, godliness is living according to God's promises and living in his power to overcome sin, to live for him. The other, contentment, expresses confidence in God's provision and in his providence. Both of these go together. Can you imagine godliness without contentment? No. Discontent is ungodly. Godliness comes with contentment. Godliness without contentment is not godliness. Contentment without godliness is a dangerous deception. If you are content... Now hear me now, if you're content to continue living in your ungodliness, you're not a Christian. You're lying to yourself. Your contentment is an illusion. It's a deception, and you have believed there is peace for you and there is no peace. If you can continue and be contented to live in ungodliness, you need to have your heart changed. If you say that you trust Christ, Christian, knowing that he is sovereign then why would you be discontented when he has promised all for your good? Discontentment is a wicked sin and needs to be repented of. True godliness with contentment will say this, as Paul did, and we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And Paul also said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Those exhibiting godliness with contentment do not worry, saying to themselves, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Bible says, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. You need to have a Godward perspective. But next, now to pursue heavenly riches, you also have to have an eternal perspective. An eternal perspective. Look at verse 7. Here Paul says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. We've got to get past looking at our temporary circumstances. Each clause in the Greek begins with nothing. Again, the nothing pushed to the front of the clause for emphasis. He's saying, listen, nothing we brought into this world, and you can be certain, nothing we're leaving with, right? (laughs) Nothing is what we're carrying out. All belongings have to be checked in at the graveside. You don't see hearses hauling trailers, right? The Bible says, for you are dust, and to dust you're going to return. Your corpse is left in the ground to rot and return to dust. You came into this world with nothing, and you're going to go out with nothing. Now think about it for a moment. That reality, that truth, this is an eternal perspective. 
This is why we should have this spiritual and Godward and eternal perspective on life. This communicates such a temporary and fleeting state for us. We're just here one minute, gone the next. We're like the, the grass that grows and then withers and dies and is burned. This communicates such a temporary state. It, 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 that's why greed and desire and covetousness in this world is so absurd, so irrational. If you came into this world with nothing and you're going to leave with nothing, then why don't you spend all of your time on this earth laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Because there is nothing that's going to last this. Listen to Job. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'm going to return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We've got to be able to say that with that perspective. A right perspective of not dwelling on temporary circumstances. We need an eternal perspective. Listen to Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there's nothing in his hand. And as he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. In other words, he came into this world naked. He works, 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 and then he dies. And he can't take anything with him. All that labor, he leaves all of it behind. And he says, this is a severe evil. Just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what prophet has he who has labored for the wind? It is vanity. In all his days, he goes on to say, he also eats in darkness and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. You can hear the sort of exasperation in Solomon's writings with the futility and vanity of this life apart from heavenly riches in Christ. It's just fleeting and passing and temporary. You're going to leave and leave all of it behind. So why not work for Christ? This life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Christ tells a parable that wonderfully communicates this in Luke chapter 12. He says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And so he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and I'll build greater. And there I will store up all my crops and all my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, you fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You got to make sure that you have heavenly riches, not worldly rags. You need to make sure that you are secure with great gain, not with the trappings of this passing world. And lastly, in verse 8, we're to have a satisfied perspective, a satisfied perspective. Paul says in verse 8, in having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Christians are simply to accept what the Lord provides and to avoid covetousness. Again, this is the heart attitude of the Christian. Again, not here so much a command as it is a statement of fact. The Bible certainly commands you to be content. The Bible certainly commands you to pursue, pursue godliness. But here, this contentedness is a statement of fact about the Christian. Christians are going to be satisfied. They're going to be content with the basic necessities of life. In other words, they're not going to be prone to lusts and covetousness. Listen to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. The proverb says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Now, many people can say, give me neither poverty. You got to keep reading, all right? <laughs> give me neither poverty nor, can you keep reading? Are you able to do that? <laughs> Feed me, Lord, with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And what are we to be content with here? Again, the basic necessities of life. We're to be content with food. And that word there for clothing in the Greek really means covering. Now, a little footnote with that. The purpose of clothing is to conceal the body. A little lesson on modesty, okay? Purpose of clothing is to conceal, not reveal. It is to conceal the body. But that word 
covering, really is a better translation, could also include shelter, just protection, okay? So the Christian is to certainly obey the Scripture in faithfully providing for his household. But the Christian is not meant to strive to amass wealth. With these, we shall be content having food and clothing. As we seek to live for the Lord, the Lord may decide to bless you with wealth. And that's the Lord's doing. But we are to deal with that wealth according to our living for Him, deal with that wealth according to the guidelines and the commands that we have in Scripture, and we're to be content with the basics. With these, we shall be content. And again, what the Christian looks like, it's more a statement of fact. Now this world, this word for content has an old sense that certainly is carried forward in the use of this word in the Greek, right? There's an old scent, sense to that word contentment, and that word is competence. And this old word competence, what that means is, uh, what competence was, was an inheritance. It was a sum of money that a person could live off of for the rest of their life. It just gave them enough money, they could live their lives, and with that they would be satisfied. And it was generally something that was not earned, not earned, okay? So now consider this for a moment. In the world at that time, if you had this competence, it was something in a worldly way that you would live off of, you would live off for the rest of your life, and you generally typically didn't earn it. Put that in its spiritual sense. You have everything. You have everything that you need in Christ. Everything has been given to you. You have all sufficiency in God. You've been given great competence that you didn't earn. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. God gave it to you. And it is sufficient for your eternal life. It will last you into all eternity. You're not going to die. You're going to be, if you're a Christian, in heaven one day, worshiping Him for all, all eternity. And those great riches that God secured for you in Christ will enable you to live. You're going to be a beneficiary of His mercy, a beneficiary of His grace for all eternity. In that sense, a great competence. We, in this life, are simply to be satisfied, content with the basics. Discontentment always wants something more always wants something else, always wants something different. As Philip Ryken says this, it's always, it always thinks about what it lacks. But even when you get what you think you want, a new home, a better job, another outfit, more toys, whatever, you soon find that you are discontent all over again. This is because like a noxious weed, discontent is rooted in the heart. And I want you to hear this. Discontent comes from what a man is not from what he doesn't have. You get that? If you're a new creation in Christ, then you're going to have godliness with contentment. If you're that old man, you've got that old wicked stony heart in your chest, it's the old man, the old heart that produces discontent. It's not doesn't come from what you don't have. Listen, think about it in this way now. You have great riches in Christ. You've heard that statement, the grass is always greener on the other side. Why is the grass always greener on the other side? This is a big pile of manure over there, making it look greener. <laughs> Be content with what you have. Be content with the basics of this life, with food and clothing. With these we shall be content because we have heavenly riches in heaven. We have treasure stored up for us in heaven with Christ. Be content. Don't covet. Live according to these perspectives and obey verse 8. This looks differently than what most professing Christians today would understand. Uh, but there are some guidelines here that you can use. This is difficult now. I mean, professing Christianity today does not get this. Covetousness, these lusts are rampant throughout the professing church today. Rampant among professing Christians. You know, you've got to look at your circumstances correctly and allow the Word of God to convict you here. Let me give you some guidelines to make sure that you're doing that, okay? And these are quick. We'll, we'll look at them more in depth next week. But number one, Everything you have has been given to you as a stewardship. You are to expend those things which you've been given on supporting yourselves, supporting your family, and the next you're to expend them in furthering the kingdom and ministry work. Now I say that what you've got, it's prudent to plan to, prepare, to, to provide for your family. It's prudent and wise to have an emergency fund. It's prudent and wise if you're going to end up retiring to save a little for retirement. Make sure you can take care of your family in retirement. 
But all of the rest of it is for the purpose, God gives it to you, for the purpose of expending it on your own lusts. No, he doesn't. He gives it to you for the purpose of furthering the kingdom, of doing ministry work. Therefore, does your spending reflect those circumstances? Where are you spending your money? You opened up your checkbook. Could you tell what your priorities are by looking at what you spend? Number two, you must learn to accept the difference between wants and needs. Learn the difference. I need that. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> Combined with curbing your spending, according to number one, this is going to increase your ability. It should increase your ability to give, okay? Number three, spend less than you make. Don't go into bad debt. Don't go into credit card debt. Spend less than you make and give the rest to God. Four, Believers must give sacrificially to the Lord. Matthew chapter 6 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Man, i got to give you that bigger boat. i got to get that bigger. I, I want to play golf every weekend this year. Yeah, lay up for yourselves, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Make yourself rich in Christ Jesus. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Number five, be thankful to the Lord. This attitude of contentment should produce in you great thankfulness, very great gratefulness to God. And you'll be content with the basic necessities of life. Jesus Christ is the true treasure of your soul, isn't he? If he's not... What do you have to look forward to? You've got nothing. You've got nothing to look forward to but a certain fiery expectation of judgment. Christ is the true treasure of the soul. The human heart will never ultimately be satisfied with worldly riches, which are really just worldly rags. The human heart is in need of a transformation. In that transformation, the human heart finds its greatest need its greatest hope, its greatest joy, its greatest security, its greatest purpose, its greatest satisfaction in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you're in Christ, that should be great comfort to your soul. You know, the Word of God is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Allow the Word of God now to, to afflict the comfortable for a moment. Without Christ, you are a thief. You are a traitor. You are miserable, naked, and desperately poor. Unimaginably poor. Clothed in your own filthy and worldly rags. All those riches that you pursued in this life, all the pleasures, the leisure, the worldly gain, will be one day to you as a millstone around your neck that will drown you in destruction and perdition. Are you afflicted by your spiritual poverty? If you're not, you can't be rich in Christ. The Bible says, blessed, saved, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever mourned over your sin? Godly sorrow that produces a mourning over sin, that produces a repentance which leads to salvation. Has it produced in you a radical change in your life? For you know, as the Bible says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become what? Might become rich. Great gain. Heavenly riches. The Bible says in Colossians 3 that Christ is all in all. Is he your all in all? Can you say that you've got one thing in your profit ledger, one name on the asset side of your accounting before God, and that's Christ. Can you say that before the Lord? Will you come to him? Will you leave those liabilities behind? Will you forsake them? Count them as the rubbish that they are. Will you forsake them and give your all to Christ? Every beggar may come to Christ. Every sin-sick soul can come to Christ. If you are lame or blind, 
then come to Christ and gain your strength and gain your sight. But if you are a Pharisee who thinks within himself that he is righteous, you are far from the kingdom, far from him. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, come. Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Come. Come to Christ. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And my Bible says to do it now. My Bible says to obey that now. Turn from your sin now. Put your faith in Christ now. Turn from your life now. Why will you wait? Why will you delay? That is absurd. You can be a son in the kingdom now. You can be an inheritor of every heavenly rich riches there are now. You can be an adopted son in God's family now. You will turn from your sin and trust Christ alone. Everything about this world is fleeting and is passing away. At any moment, it is gone, and you can be certain you'll take nothing out of here when you go. You'll stand naked and exposed before the God of the universe that will judge you and hold you accountable for what you've done in this fleeting life. And you'll pay for your sin for all eternity in hell. Or you can have true great gain in Christ Jesus our Lord and inherit heaven, inherit Christ, where you'll worship and praise the Lamb who is slain for all eternity. Will you come? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. God, thank you for this great gain now this mercy, this grace is just lavished upon us. God, protect us from falling into foolish and worldly lusts that seek to drown us in destruction and perdition. God, by your Spirit, preserve us to the end to be saved and protect us from these schemes of the wicked one, these lies of these deceiving sharks. God, and help us to stay true to your word and faithful to you content with the basics and satisfied, glorious, gloriously satisfied with Christ our Savior, our Lord. We praise you and thank you that you have rescued us out of the bondage of that filth, bondage and slavery to our own sin. And you, you have set us up, God, in, in heavenly places, given us an inheritance. And thank you, Lord, that all the promises that you've given are yes and amen in Christ. And we, Lord, want to live with that perspective, a spiritual perspective on heavenly riches, a, a Godward perspective and holy living and contentment, and an eternal perspective that the things of this life are passing away and that we, to be wise, must lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven. God, just a satisfied perspective that Christ is our all in all. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity to worship you together in Jesus' name. Amen.